And there are so many interdependencies. So can you, Yale, kind of uh, talk us through a little bit more about kind of how the health equity, access to healthcare and that precision diagnosis, you know, what's, you know, you sort of touched on it a little bit earlier, but can you expand on that? It's, it's, a, it's a great topic. And, and Mariana touched on the diagnostic odyssey uh, when she mentioned the 10 years in Latin America, the numbers are not much smaller you know, the, the time time is not so much shorter in in the us which is a an advanced uh, com a country with um, top tier medical care so how do we start I, I think starting from diagnosis is is critical um i i talked before about having very small patient populations that do not have a critical mass to move the needle and and get interest from uh, the industry to develop therapies and by accessing more patients, getting more genetic testing done, getting more diagnosis, we can change the, the map for that. And I, I, I did see that some of my friends from diagnostics companies are in the audience today. Please lower your prices and make your tests more accessible so more people can get tested. Uh, we're thinking of launching a diagnosis effort in, in, uh, for underprivileged populations in inner cities, in large cities in the U.S. It's a big challenge. Some families do not have food on their tables. They do not have access to education. So getting a genetic diagnosis is, why would they even consider that? And we have to make sure that this is something that when, at least when a family comes to a clinician, the clinician does offer the, the possibility of a genetic test and a diagnosis because that can change the, the life of this, of this family completely. So this is all interconnected, right? How do we get access to, to more genetic testing, find more patients, enroll them in clinical trials to your point, Mariana, how do we get more patients from diverse uh, backgrounds enrolled in clinical trials so that we learn more about not only about the disorder, but how it is in the context of someone's culture, someone's daily life. Uh, it, a, lot, a, lot can, a lot can be learned about differences between how families uh, approach these genetic diseases, have access to treatment of these genetic diseases, and incorporate that in our, in our learnings on how to, to design endpoints and how to design a clinical study. Wendy mentioned um, remote clinical studies, making it easier for families to participate in, in clinical trials and not have to schlep to a hospital in, in, a, in a plane or in a train or in a five hour car ride, but actually be able to do as much as they can from home. But this being said, they need to have the technology at home to be able to do it. So how do we make sure that that happens as well? So there's there's a lot to to, uh, to, ta to to tackle and to learn about and to make sure that we think about all these things when we start working on a specific disorder that maybe has doesn't have any therapeutic solutions at the moment, but we want to learn as much as we can and access as many patients as we can. Absolutely. And Mariana, what is a what does the ideal international collaborative approach look like? You know, what's the dream, and how can we realize that? Do you think? Yeah, so first I want to just bounce off what uh, Yael said very quickly on resources for women's health. health. And I think um, it's so important to give visibility to the concept that rare is not so rare. So obviously, you know, each individual disease may affect few people, but as a whole, they affect many people. You know, a substantial uh, percentage of of the global population. And when we consider that rare diseases affect not just the patient, but the whole family and the person, you know, the society that the person um, lives in, the impact is enormous. And in the context of women, you know, it's documented that healthy uh, women are crucial for, for the economic growth of nations. Um, and this is true also if, you know, a woman is dedicated 100% to the care of her child or her brother or whatever, whoever the patient may be. So um, I think it's important for stakeholders to recognize the true uh, impact of rare diseases on on the general society. Um, but to answer more your question, I think, you know, this is such an important point and we've been discussing it because there's strength in numbers and this is so true in rare diseases. You know, we've had cases where patients are the only person with that disease in the country 
and then they find someone else in another country, possibly in another part of the world. And this connection is so important. Um, so like for patient organizations to talk and to have that connection, I think is crucial. Um, and I think the dream would be really to have a system where, you know, information and knowledge flows freely between countries where um, innovations and treatment and care are shared and implemented widely, um, you know, where there's normative and regulatory coherence that supports the need of rare disease patients. Um, I think that's the dream. And for for the the you know, a country or region not to lag so far behind the rest of the world in terms of um, access to new therapies and new technology. Um, but of course, the barriers, again, are large, you know, to achieving um, this ideal state. Um, I think in Latin America, it has to do a lot with alignment between the different stakeholders involved and with political will. Uh, you know, the issue has to be recognized and given priority and given continuity. Um, and of course, you know, there are other barriers such as, you know, economic disparities and uh, different healthcare in infrastructure, um, but mostly a general lack of awareness, I think, and of understanding of rare diseases. Um, but I really do believe in, in building capacity you know, not only within each country, but also leveraging the strength that we have as a region and as a global rare disease community. I think that's really important, that that capacity building, because I know, you know, we talk about access a lot, don't we? But of course, and it's something I think I've, I've mentioned before in a webinar with really access means really different things depending on where you are geographically you know some of the work we've been doing on this edition access to some of the people we're speaking to means we can't get the patients from their home to a hospital because there's no road that's what access to treatment means to them whereas in other countries we think of that as being access to novel therapies and something very different so there isn't really even a commonality in the language of what that means so the idea of capacity building in those countries where we can at least all be having the same conversation around what access really is and what it means. So I think that's a that's a really important point to add there. Wendy, was there something you looked like you were going to say something there? No, but I will because you gave me the mic. Um, I think that access conversation is really important and probably a subject of a whole nother um, yeah. webinar because we think a lot about mm -hmm. as access to a specific medication. But to Marianna's point, the need in rare disease and where we are today, you know, there are very, very few conditions that have a treatment. So what we're really talking about is equitable access to the healthcare system. And that starts with being heard. Yeah, absolutely. I want to do a little bit of a, a pivot now because it is International Women's Day. So I want to really kind of delve into that a little bit more um, and really uh, sort of think about what the nuances are for being a woman working in science. So I don't know, Lara, do you want to kick us off with that? You know, as somebody working in, in the field, mm -hmm. are there any sort of specific nuances as a woman professional in that career? Well, I mean, I think it's it's definitely a lot to juggle. You know, I, um, I'm a CEO. I, I happen to live with a condition. And last year I became a mother in addition to that. And that introduced me to a whole new world of juggling and <laughs> prioritising. And I think it is difficult. And I think, you know, something that culturally blew my mind, obviously, we have the privilege of being a global organization. So half my team is from the US. And when they have a baby, they're expected or in their minds, we don't run that we have a, a nice, healthy um, um, maternity policy, but they, they thought it would be perfectly normal to come back to work within two weeks of having a baby. And that just blew my mind because in the UK we have, you know, lots of, of systems to to support that. But it's absolutely expected that a woman just goes back to work and is is juggling all these things. And I, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's really interesting and, and definitely shouldn't be the way that it is. I think that um, I feel um, very lucky and privileged to have never had a challenge uh, with my gender and my role. Um, I think in addition to being a woman, I'm also a gay woman. Um, and I often find that that might have weirdly helped me in a way because, um, you know, my appearance is quite androgynous and it's not 
as many traditional men assume a, a woman to to always look and so I kind of challenge their perceptions and and you know thoughts on on what a woman is and looks like so when I get on stage with my tattoos and they're almost a little bit overwhelmed to have any judgment which yeah. I think is quite <laughs> my favor. uh goodness knows what people may may have said behind my back but I've always felt respected actually and included and as an equal around the table where I haven't felt that is as a patient um for sure so professionally I have never felt that being a woman has has prevented me from gaining a seat at any table or get getting respect but definitely it has done as a patient so yeah it's an interesting observation what about you Mariana I see you were nodding quite a bit through that what's your experience been with this no I agree completely um you know I I think you have to let your work speak for itself and not really not focus so much on having to prove yourself because you are a woman um I think in my case again I have been very lucky also um not to really have faced any resistance because of my gender I think in my case I feel like I've face resistance more often because of my age than because I, I am a woman. Um, and I don't take that for granted. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's clear it's because of the women that have kind of paved the way for us. Um, that said, I think the participation of women in decision-making roles on boards of directors on a research paper is sometimes still kind of a checkbox for a checkbox for diversity rather than, you know, a critical, value addition. Um, and I think, you know, while representation is essential, um, I really think our presence on boards, on teams, on publications, on anything should be, you know, predicated on the expertise and the insight we bring, uh, rather than just because, you know, we're a woman or because we're a Latin American or we could because we're a minority. Um, so I really think, and it's, it's really important for me to be you know, for it to be about our meritocracy and ensuring that anyone's participation is based on their capacity to add value and that they are acknowledged for their skills and contribution to the field. It's really interesting what you said there about papers and publications, because I've recently done an interview where uh, the woman said that that was a factor in when they had their went chose to have a baby to try and minimalize the impact on their career and the timing of that. But also that while on maternity leave, even though a project that they had run and been the lead on, their name was dropped off of the publication because it was kind of a snooze or lose because she was on maternity leave. And I was horrified. Is that something you've seen, Yale, in terms of that, you know, the worry of women as to the impact on their career? I think the numbers talk, right? I mean, there are just <laughs> as many postdocs, uh, men and women. But as you climb up the totem pole, sometimes it becomes more men dominated. I still go to biotech conferences and their panel discussions, and they're all men, not one woman. And it's not because there aren't amazing women available to speak in panels. It's because men's clubs are men's clubs and they tend to invite their friends so uh, we have to break through that and and uh, volunteer to speak and 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 i know it makes us travel more lara but we have to to be out there and make sure that we we are known and that our colleagues are known and we get invited it's just it's it action speaks so there's no other way to do it and I know this could almost be a, it could really be a, a, a revenue of its own, but you know, how, Wendy, how do we smash the glass ceiling? You know, I really love that question. And I, it's funny when you actually visualize a glass ceiling, I'm not sure how smashable it is, but if we bring <laughs> it back to rare diseases and, and women, women fight daily for equity. And there's just the reality of historic bias and it's lingering disparate social, economic, political health effects. The majority of rare and ultra rare diseases are monogenic in nature. And that, as Yale was explaining, means they're caused by an error in a single gene. Years ago, a rare disease diagnosis left patients with their worst fears realized that nothing could be done. Today, genomic testing can help pinpoint the exact location of that genetic error, and gene therapy presents the possibility of treatment. So it's still a long way off for most rare disease commun community and patients within a disorder. But if we think about 
smashing that glass ceiling, it goes back to understanding that the vast majority of people involved in this world that are impacted personally are women. And so how do we actually create the space for women to be on those panels and be at the table and bringing to the conversation everything that they're experiencing? And some of it starts with focusing on diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, access to more genomic testing and sharing all that we learn. Um, it's a path to change. And so I think at this point, all roads lead to women are the voices that need to be heard. And that's how we're going to smash the glass ceiling. And Lara, you mentioned that you, you know, you obviously you're a patient, you're working and you've, you've recently become a mom as well. You know, do you feel, you know, is there a trade off? Is there a point when you're, you know, we, we all think we can have it all. We won't want to have it all. But is there, you know, is there a point when there has to be a trade off for you with that? Because that's a lot for you to kind of have a lot of balls in the air at any one time. <laughs> It is. Um, it's honestly a daily challenge. And I don't know if you can hear and tell, but I've been unwell for what feels like about five weeks at the moment. And I think for me, the trade off has been my self care. Um, I'm worrying about my daughter, I'm worrying about my wife and being at home, being present when I can, working all that was trying to, you know, do breakfast with my daughter, then go straight to the gym, then go straight into work, get finished work in time to do bath and bedtime sometimes having evening calls because of time zone differences, trying to get early nights and sleep. And often sometimes the pressure and effort of everything you need to do holistically to live with a, a, a rare condition that hasn't got any therapeutics is, is diet, is sleep, is movement, or all these things that require a lot of effort and time. And it's a job in itself to keep well. And as you can hear and probably see, I'm not doing the best job of that. And I've just finished an intensive five-day retreat with our staff team where everyone flew in from over the world and and it was wonderful but you've got to be present and you've got to be there and you've got to be on you know and I'm the boss so I have to be energizing everyone and and leading by example and um it's tough it's really tough and I know that that's not sustainable and that you know I need to work on that a lot more but I'm dealing with a one-year-old a global organization and a rare disease and it's tough yeah and I think guilt you know women naturally carry so much guilt you know we always feel we're never doing enough and it's you know especially as soon as you have children you never know what guilt is until you have a child and then you just feel it perennially <laughs> yeah. so I, I know we've got some questions come in so I'm mindful of time and I want to get to those but I would before we uh, move on to those just like to kind of end on asking each of you if there's one bit of advice that you could give to a woman in rare or someone thinking about coming into this as a profession mm. what would be your kind of nugget of advice that you would like to give to them and I'm going to start with you first Yale if that's okay Sure. I don't know that I have specific advice for women in rare, but looking at this panel as maybe that's my closing remark for the panel is it's our responsibility to advance and, and think about women for ev on every activity that we uh, take on, whether we're organizing a conference, a panel, whether we're hiring, whether we're mentoring, make sure that women are on the top of our list and, and, and continuously think about it and disseminate this uh, to others as well. Mm -hmm. wonderful thank you and Lara I think I kind of agree in the sense that you know it goes back to that cliche be the change that you know is needed not because you're a woman but because that's what's needed um and take advantage of 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 the strength you may have as a woman but there's also so fantastic men out there who are just as willing um to to help and and to collaborate so my advice would be um, be strong, stand still uh, on your own, but always lean on those around you collaboratively wherever you can. Oh, I love that. And, and Mariana? Yeah, I would also say, um, you know, I, I agree with that sentiment and just really stand by your work um, and take every opportunity um, to showcase your work and capabilities so that next time, you know, it's not just a tick box, but a true insights in the insight, it, interest in the insights um, you know, you can provide. Thank you. And Wendy. Um, thank you. Just to bring it home back to the question about, you know, anybody wanting to consider getting into rare. And I would just say, run through that door. You'll never be the same person. You'll never look back. Um, we can't underestimate the power of community and how important it is to continue to support what each community needs. And the rare disease 
community has given far more back than I can even ever have imagined. And I've got a lot of heroes in the community. Oh, thank you, Wendy. What a lovely way to end. Um, so I'm going to jump onto some questions that we've got here. And I'll try and get a couple in before we finish. Um, so one we've got here says, what laws, policy or governance do you think governments could can make to bring the most impactful change to women in rare disease? And I think you touched on quite a bit of this, Marianne, in terms of that governance and policy. But do you want to add anything to that? Sure. I think one of the most important um, policies is for... Um, is for caregivers. Uh, as I said, 90% or more of caregivers are women and that um, that implies often leaving the workforce and your contribution to society and all of this. And they're uh, most, you know, rare, rare uh, policy caregiver, um, I'm sorry, I got confused. More rare disease caregiver policies um, are not robust enough or do not even exist. Um, for it to be, you know, a level playing ground. So I think that's one of the biggest ones. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would not just that, that, Nicole. I think there's an opportunity to think about policy as it relates to carriers too. So so often when a child is diagnosed, the the mom is the carrier and diagnosed also, and then that starts a whole nother healthcare journey where they often don't have access to the same. Um, regulatory privileges, and so thinking about the impact from a policy perspective for carriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lara, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I, I, you know, I often advocating for the fact that when we're thinking about pathways and guidelines, that um, the mental health is seen in the same way as the physical health. So when a diagnosis is given, there's a pathway for the physical side of things, but there's also a, a, a psychological mental health pathway because often you're told you've got a disease condition that's never going away, that there's no cure for. It's a lot to take on. It's often the, the um, end of a very long diagnostic odyssey where there's been gaslighting and lack of belief and you're not going to be in the strongest place. So anyone is going to need that support. People may not take it, but it should always be offered as a given every time. That is uh, leads absolutely perfectly into the next question, which is what role should genetic counsellors play in accelerating diagnosis of rare disease? And how do we better connect women with genetic counsellors, given that 90 percent of women are the caregivers in rare disease, too? So I guess that's part of the same thing. Uh, isn't that yeah, I can comment because uh, I know I know that actually the number of genetic counsellors in the U.S. is is going down. So it's, it's reduced over time and, and not enough people are, are choosing this as their profession. I think, again, it's our responsibility to educate mm -hmm. high schools, universities, go out and talk about rare disease, go out and talk about the importance of genetic counseling so that this profession does not die. Yeah. And also for the genetic counselors to go out and educate within their communities, within their hospitals about the importance of genetic counseling. And for every clinician that has a patient walk into their into their clinic that has a, 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 an unclear diagnosis to make sure that uh, genetic test and genetic counseling is included in the workup of this patient. So it's education, education, education. Yeah. And, and we've got another question here. What support would make the biggest difference to female advocacy group leaders? Um, Lara, maybe one for you if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think, you know, there's a real space for um for, for women and, and anyone really in the advocacy space and 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 I think that goes hand in hand in what I was saying that there is a, a wonderful increase in lived experience and 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 that the voices of of leaders in that space. So I think that um you know coming together, avoiding the fragmentation again, because that is seen so much in the advocacy world as well. Um, and leaders being able to uh, get involved in the kind of changes that we're discussing are needed. I think that often um, it's when the advocates and the leaders are left behind that the decisions aren't progressed in the way that they need to. And, and I, it, it's all that circle of lived experience, lived experience, lived experience, and, and that's both advocates <laughs> as well. I, I think going back to what Wendy said before, it's, it's don't try to reinvent the wheel, leverage the learnings of the community there's so many people that have walked that path. I'm sure Lara gets phone calls weekly from other advocacy groups to learn from her about what she did. Mm -hmm. So th there are so many resources out there. Don't don't feel lost. Just just connect with as many people as possible. 
Thank you. And I'm going to go to one last question because I think it's quite a good one. And it's kind of around that theme of the collaboration, the international collaboration. And it's how can we hold a mirror up to companies to drive change within constraints of budget um, in terms of getting access um, across different countries and language? So, you know, for example, how are we sharing all of this great quality content, but in a language that reaches more people? So I guess in the theme of that collaboration, I don't know, Wendy or Mariana, who might want to take that one? start yeah Wendy please oh <laughs> um I think it's I think the question is a really good one and that it sort of gets back down to how do we break down the silos and and hold ourselves accountable so we're not in a world today where it's okay just to have any assets or information in English it's not okay so I sat in on a workshop a couple of weeks ago that was really eye-opening for me about thinking about the concept of reverse translation so actually writing a piece, whether it's an informed consent form or a protocol or something, writing that piece in lo local language first and then translating it to English. And the data was really compelling because you get a different document when you actually start in local language. And so if we, if we just change the way we behave and the way we practice, that's then going to grow and get legs and, be, and become at scale. So it starts with small change, but I think holding people accountable really matters. Mariana? Yeah, I agree with that. And what we've done is, um, I mean, we we publish most of our papers in international journals, so they're in English, but we do translate them into Spanish. And then we also translate them from like medical language to late, you know, normal language that anyone not in the medical field is going to understand to make sure that you know, patients and um, people who need access to this information can get get the it get it in the language um, and in a way that is understandable. Thank you. I'm so mindful of the time, and I thank you so much for everyone who's bared with us. It's great to see that we haven't had any drop off going on over time, which is always great. Um, honestly, I can't think of a better way to have marked International Women's Day than having this fantastic chat with you, wonderful ladies. It's been so insightful and I really appreciate your time. I know when we're across different time zones, it's always difficult to make it easy for everyone. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insights. Uh, thank you also to everyone else who's listened and, and for your really insightful questions. Um, and I hope you use today to celebrate the special women in your personal and professional lives and to show them how much you see them, hear them and appreciate them. So to the men and women out there, make sure you you acknowledge those women in your lives today. Um, in the meantime, if anyone's got any other questions that they haven't got, we haven't got to today, we'll endeavour to answer those afterwards. Also, the videos from today's session will be available for people to catch up on if you haven't seen all of the sessions. So thank you very much. And uh, we'd love to uh, just let hear from anyone afterwards. But yeah, have a great rest of your day. And thank you again to our panel.